thank, uh, thank you for that introduction, and I'm very, very happy to be here in Bologna. Um, I think years ago, about 20 years ago, when I was an undergraduate, I thought, oh, I'd love to go and study in Bologna, and uh, it didn't happen, but now I'm here, and uh, so it's very nice to be here, and um, I even sent some pictures back of the beautiful scenery around, uh, including to my sister, because I know she loves Italy, and she was like, what are you there? How can you be in Bologna? And I said, well, I'm at a peace-building conference. She's like, peace-building conference in Bologna? Don't you, don't you need to have a peace-building conference where there's conflict? And I was like, well, yeah, you, you, you can do that. She says, why aren't you having it in the UK Parliament right now? Because this is where you need peace-builders. So as you can hear from my accent, I am from, uh, I'm from the UK, although I'm increasingly from Scotland, actually, which is, has a different perspective on things. But anyway, moving, moving swiftly on to uh, my presentation, Basically, some of you will have one of these beside you, and it's also an exercise in being a good peace builder and sharing resources equitably with your partners, because there's not enough for all of you. Um, if there, I am going to be referring to some things in this report and some graphics in this report that, particularly people at the back of the room, you're going to struggle with uh, to see what I actually mean. And, and it's not really important that you know the detail. Uh, but if you are interested in the detail, it's here. This report's also available online, uh, and it's free. Um, so if you don't get a hard copy today, there are other ways of getting it. So essentially, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to really talk about the factors that influence European support to peace building. And this is official support. Uh, what are the things that have consistently, over time, uh, influenced how peace building is supported by governments. Basically, why did we decide to do this study? Because I work for a, a think tank, so I'm not, a, I'm not an academic, uh, I'm not a, a practitioner. Uh, I used to be a practitioner and way, way back I used to kind of be an academic. Um, but basically, as a think tank and we're non-partisan, we're not a specialist peace building organization, uh, the genesis of this study came about from some of the sentiments that we heard expressed in the first uh, that a palpable feeling that the world is changing more significantly in the last few years than it has been in previous decades and that that could have quite a significant impact on peace building and the question that we had as, uh, the European Centre for Development Policy Management was well, what, what factors do influence European support to peace building? And how have they changed over the last few years? And how might they change in the future? Um, and also, the other thing we heard from outside, both from official actors and also civil society activists, was we are really concerned about these changes that are happening. We really feel that support for peace building may be very detrimentally impacted by what is going on globally uh, in the world today. And also a desire to say, well, how do we respond to these changes? So, you know, basically thinking, well, if we understand what's driving these changes, maybe we can, we can think about responses to them. So basically we did two and a half years of policy research. We interviewed about 70 people in four different uh, countries. We looked at over 600 pieces of documentation, a lot of policy work, but also a lot of evaluations and some academic work. And the 70 people we interviewed were people who were directly involved in policy related to peace building. And we interviewed them completely off the record. And as ECDPM, we usually have quite access to, to senior level policy people. So these are directors in foreign ministries and the like. And we um, basically asked them about how the world was changing, what, what were things that were driving them, and got them to do it in a way that was, well, they didn't feel they were going to be quoted and reported back and get into trouble for what they were saying. Um, it's qualitative and quantitative, so there, are, there is some numbers here, and they're not unproblematic, the numbers, and I will get to them, uh, but uh, also the research methods were a bit mixed. We chose to focus on four case studies, and why did we choose these case studies? Well, we chose to focus on Germany, Sweden, the UK, and the EU institutions. We chose to focus, we did an initial scan, and we said, okay, what are the policy commitments that are already in play? And what are the financial commitments already in play? And we chose four of the top ones of those. So the ones who have most consistently had policy statements saying, 
who support peace building and those who put money behind it. So we kind of self-selected those. And I think uh, Bernardo was saying maybe, uh, maybe there was a flaw in our methodology. Maybe we should have gone for those that, 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 that haven't done that. And that's something we can come back to. Um, and we're going to try and draw some implications for what does it mean for support to peace building in the future. So that's what we did. And then the first question comes, and we talked about this this morning, well, what is peace? Um, earlier, no, late last year, the European Union put out a press statement about what a great job it was doing about peace building in the Horn of Africa, talking primarily about mi uh, uh, support to military action of the, the, the African Union it was doing there, to which many in the peace building community went, that's not peace building. That's something completely different. That's the opposite of peace building. So we thought we needed to have a definition of peace building. So it's long-term measures, sociopolitical and cultural institutions capable of addressing the root causes of conflict. This is all terminology that is quite familiar. It's also signed off by the Development Assistance Committee of the OECD, which four case studies were members of, and so in studies have signed up to this definition. And it also happened at the start of our research period. So this is a definition that we're not transposing on people uh, today that wasn't in play when we started the, the research. This one you won't be able to see unless you've got the document in front of you, but on page seven or eight of the synthesis report, if you have it, you can look at it. And basically what we see here is there is a sort of 25 year, 30 year journey in support to peace building in terms of policy commitments. It was mentioned this morning that uh, the uh, Agenda for Peace, Boutros Boutros Ghali's Agenda for Peace in 1992, was the first time where in policy terms, even though it had been around academia, there was a specific commitment to peace building. And since then, commitments to peace building, uses of the terminology of, of, of peace building or conflict prevention and peace building, have appeared in many statements and policy commitments by the when and by our four case studies over different periods of time. There's been a sort of rhetorical repackaging. It's gone away. It's maybe, maybe talk more about stabilization at a certain time or human security. Um, but it, it has been around in policy statements for a while. And usually, as you see here, these little fires, often after uh, Rwanda, the R Rwanda or the Balkan Wars or the start of the Iraq War, global war on terrorism, Arab Spring, these policy frameworks have been refreshed, the terminology has been officially refreshed, and a slightly different emphasis has been given to it. But what you can't say is there's no conflict policy. Both at the EU level, the UN level, and certain countries, the case studies, there's a lot of conflict policy, and most of it's pretty good. It's actually things that most peace-building organizations would say, recognize that. It talks about long-term, multi-stakeholder, uh, engagement, the importance of engaging uh, women in 1325. The language is good. I mean, there's always things you can improve on it, but the commitments are there. So we've had 30 years of, of, of global and EU commitments um, and certain member states committing to it. So that must be good. We must be doing really well for peace building. Yeah, well, basically, as we heard this morning, the trends related to violent conflict and political space are not going in the right direction. So again, if you want the details, three and four of the synthesis report in front of you. But, you know, some quite worrying trends about an uptick in conflict since 2014, closing political space, including in Europe, um, rising military expenditure, uh, rising number of battle deaths, over two billion people suffering from um, the effects of, of violence, not necessarily violent uh, you know, uh, conflict, but also criminalized violence, etc. So we really don't have the trends pointing in the right direction despite uh, 20 years, 30 years of good policy. So when we were trying to look at, well, what are the factors that over time have influenced uh, support to peace building? And what are we talking about when we're talking about support to peace building? Well, we narrowed it down to, we're talking about political support and, and policy commitments because we're not evaluating it from the ground. This is very much a, a top-down look, which has its flaws, but th that's where the gap was. And we're also looking at financial commitment. So wh what kind of financial support is being... Okay, this is a, a, a basically a diagram where at the bottom, we're looking at support to peace building. So we're, we want to really understand where that comes from. And essentially, from our analysis, there are two things. It, comes from a choice of the top political level. 
So this is your foreign ministers, your prime ministers, your uh, maybe your junior ministers of, of development cooperation. They make certain choices and also the bureaucracy make choices. So for example, setting up a particular fund for supporting civil society in Iraq may not be a top level political choice. It may be a choice from senior level in the bureaucracy to, to do that. So we were looking at what drives the top political level and what drives choices from the bureaucracy um, and also what constrains them. So your national or your EU system of governance really constrains what you can do. Um, and that's related to constitutional order, the way that government is structured. And I'll just give you an example for that. Um, so Sweden finds it quite easy to set up flexible funds uh, administered by their, um, uh, their development agency. Other governments, just because the way the governments are set up, it's, nothing, it's not a conspiracy against peace building, it's just incredibly difficult for them to do that. Um, so that system of governance is really important and these things are fixed and don't really change over time. Uh, and governments generally have been pretty un un unwilling to take risks around conflict uh, for a while. The two main factors that influenced the political level choices and the choice from the bureaucracy other than this system of governance was the geopolitical era you're in and your domestic political culture. Geopolitical era is in the entire space for supporting peace building and government support for peace building really opened up in the late 1990s um, and continued to open up uh, political terms and financial terms until September the 11th hit and then the political space was constrained but the money got even bigger. People were even putting even more resources behind that. So, some interesting trends there. So, and as our assertion is, as the geopolitical era is changing, and I think most analysts, no one can quite agree where we're moving to. We're moving to a, 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 an illiberal order or what it is, and you can read articles in foreign affairs about that. But that is going to have a massive impact on peace building, given what has happened in the past. And then the second thing is domestic political culture. Why does Germany and Sweden uh, and the UK really support peace building, both in policy terms and financial terms, when France and Spain don't? I mean, what's the history of that? Um, and we went and looked back, and this political culture, domestic political culture, transcends um, political parties. So political parties have come and gone in all these, these countries, yet, and they put different emphasis when different governments have got in control. Maybe it's more about stabilization, or maybe it's more about people-to-people -people peace building. Um, but domestic political culture is also about narratives the, the, political cult the, the, the countries tell about themselves that people recognize them in. So Germany after the Second World War, you know, we, are, we want to be a force for good in the world and we have a modest foreign policy but a strong pacifist tradition that is very strongly fought by civil society throughout politics. Um, so actually engaging and being a peace actor is part of what Germany thinks about in relation to its foreign policy and actually when they try and engage more offensively military, there's a huge pushback in the culture. Um, the UK, it has a more militaristic view of international affairs, but believes itself to be a global player. Uh, and so, and to be interventionist globally, has no problem with that. Um, the EU likes to think of itself as a peace project. So of course peace is part of its external offer and its normative values, amongst other things. Um, uh, with Sweden, it's a small, uh, a small country that believes in the global rule-based liberal order and that's part of the, the institutional fabric and the DNA of the foreign policy, no matter who changes government. That's kind of difficult to replicate and to suddenly transpose. But the two things that we found about these things that, that, that were sort of either concerning or open up opportunities is geopolitical era and domestic political culture don't change often. These are things that are fairly stacked 30, 40 year periods. But right now, they are changing. I mean, particularly leading to each other. So you've seen in Sweden, for example, the rise of a far right party, um, you know, which you've never had before, which challenge, challenges the narratives on how Sweden engages with the rest of the world um, in a very Swedish way. So they want to cut Swedish aid to 0.7%. Which, <laughs> which is like, you know, twice, three times as much as most other countries. Um, that, those weren't the only two things that influenced support to peace building. So I'll just look at the other ones as well. So basically, 
Um, what your allies and other governments do that you feel close to, there's quite a lot of what I think is called in the development sector isoformic, isoformic mimicry, which is basically, ooh, the UK's got a stabilization unit. The Germans go, we want one of those because the UK's got one of them. Now, whether UK soft power is going to be uh, uh, that as much now, but there's quite a lot of taking policy ideas, taking conceptual ideas, taking tools that are being used uh, amongst a small number of countries who feel sufficiently like-minded, and you can see that. Major conflicts and instability. So if there is a major conflict and instability, not in terms of deaths, but in terms of closeness to Europe and strategic significance to Europe. So Iraq, Afghanistan, what happened in Ukraine has had an impact. Um, domestic events with an international dimension. Uh, the two ones that we that keep, kept coming back in the interviews and the analysis was terrorist attacks so major terrorist attacks in Europe. And also um, uh, the second ones were uh, the, the response to the migration situation. I wouldn't, won't call it an influx or a crisis, but that those, as it touched the top table of domestic politics, it filtered through everything, uh, including support to peace building in terms of the policy commitments. Rather sadly, international commitments and norms, so SDG 16, uh, on, on you know, those sort of, or the international uh, framework for peace building and state building, all that good international commitments and norms, people went, yeah, they're kind of important, but actually really when we were interviewing the director level and people, they were like, these are things we just dress up, you know, they're not the core of why we do them, um, which was quite uh, sad. This one here is a little thing that's both inside government and outside government, and that's conflict-related expertise. And we had a number of people talking about that this morning, that there are good people in the system, and we work with them to try and get good outcomes, to try and get money in the right way, to try and get political focus in the right way. That's happened a lot in these uh, four case studies, where there's, uh, particularly in the UK and the EU institutions, to a lesser extent, um, uh, Sweden a bit, uh, Germany not so much, of people going from government to academia and NGOs and back again, bringing skills and experience on conflict prevention and peace building. And this has been very influential, but a fairly low level. It's, been, it's not been influential on foreign policy or development policy writ large, but more influential on just the more specific conflict-related policy. So that's where, and, and we feel there's a bit of a glass ceiling for that. So these people can't get above a certain level in, even if they're great peace builders and they really want to make change, they get stuck at a certain level because the politics and the, some of these other drivers sort of overwhelm their ability to say, well, you really need to take a complex sensitive approach to your entire strategy for Libya. Uh, you know, a lot of frustration where the expertise is there, the knowledge is there, but it's not being taken seriously up inside the bureaucracies and at the political level. Okay, so basically, to rush through this quickly, um, funding trends for peace building. It grew 79%, yahoo, 79% increase from 2007 to 2016. 1.9 billion for peace building in 2016. I, I'm sure most of you in the room are going, well, why doesn't my organization see any of that? Or the people I work with or whatever will come to that. It's only 1% of the total amount of official overseas development aid. Yet most peace building professionals, even if they recognize there is potentially an increase, are deeply concerned about the quality of money. It comes with strings attached, it comes in bureaucratic formats, it comes with, no, we have no money for Latin America, but we really want you to engage in Iraq. You know, it comes with a lot of, we have money for countering violent extremism, but not uh, women, peace and security. Those kind of things are, were, were very um, common uh, in, in the analysis. This is the top 10 of funders for peace building over the last, uh, um, last 10 years using OECD, uh, DAC, ODA figures, which are, are far, far, far from uh, uh, sufficient, but they're the only thing we've got for comparative analysis. So they are flawed, but they're the only things. Um, can anyone spot Italy here? Anyone like to hazard a guess at where Italy would fall? If this is 1 to 10, between... 10 and 20. 20? Okay, so basically they didn't appear at all till 2014, but in 2016 they're 14, 14th on the list. But the numbers go down dramatically. So basically, 
you, to, to be number 13, you only had to put in 18 million, whereas if you were number one in 2016, you had 483. So it, it's, it's, these figures are, are, are very different. And this is a particular code called uh, uh, Civilian Peace Building and Conflict Prevention. So it's a particular code, so usually it's that exactly. Um, again, can't see it from back there, but what's interesting is the amount is increasing broadly, but actually the amount going to civil society, which is this blue one here, is staying the same. So you're actually seeing more peace building money go to uh, governments, multilateral organizations, and increasingly the private sector than civil society and peace building organizations. So again, is that another, another trend whereby civil society is actually just getting less resources or less government resources for these things? Okay, well, I'll just finish off by saying, given that we have these big trends that are driving change, not necessarily in the positive way, is the peace building community, which is you in this room, um, who are, if you're self-identified as part of the, uh, you know, care about peace building and want to drive it forward, either from an academic perspective or from an NGO activist or, or official agency perspective. Um, basically, I think peace building support is incredibly vulnerable to changes from a few donors. So basically, the funding for global institutions is really reliant on a very few small number of European organized donors. And if they change their policies and priorities, or don't want to fund you, uh, then I think we've got some, some big challenges. Um, I would also argue in each of these countries, including in countries like Germany, and we gave this presentation in the German uh, parliament, um, there's a limited political constituency for peace building as peace building is defined. And without a strong political constituency saying, we really want this, we think this is important, we think this should be prioritized, um, it's difficult to see in the current environment how peace building can continue to gain levels of support, both political support and financial support, unless there is a political constituency pushing for it. There is a role for an expert community to provide that knowledge but our analysis would be they're kind of reaching their limits on what an expert community can do. They can educate, they can inform, but they can't prior make it a priority if there's not a political constituency uh, for it. Um, so that's a challenge to go beyond the expertise level, to diversify support, uh, funding support away from governments who perhaps have, you know, who, who are the funders of peace building that aren't governments? Uh, and also, even if it is government money, how do you have dialogues to improve the quality of money? So maybe it's not about the amount, it's okay, more flexible, longer term, less can perhaps more be achieved with that. Um, and then also how to make strategic alliances beyond the peace building community. Who can you make common causes with to say these are normative agendas that we fundamentally believe in and that are important globally and uh, within countries at the same time. Um, I've probably gone over my time. I have just a little bit, so I'm going to stop here. Um, the reports are there. They're also available on our website. There's lots of questions. It's not perfect. Either the research process or maybe some of the conclusions we come to. I'm not an academic uh, anymore, so we maybe make some methodological leaps of faith that the academics in the room would like to skewer me on, and I'll be quite happy to try and answer those questions. Thank you.